Thanks everybody. Hope you're all as excited as I am to be here Rapid Fire Talk. Always some exciting uh, sessions and we're going to kick things off right away with Dr. Patrick Fleming. He's a uh, he's a very enthusiastic and uh, very keen uh, uh, research oriented as well as an outstanding uh, clinician in dermatology. And Dr. Fleming, he's a board certified dermatologist. I have the privilege of practicing practicing with him at Lynn Center for Lynn Institute for Dermatology. And he is also assistant professor at University of Toronto. He is a clinical associate at the University Health Network and also works as staff at Toronto-based COVID assessment centers. He has a master's degree in community health and he has an interest in infectious diseases, especially COVID-19. He completed the Global Clinical Scholars Program in Advanced Epidemiology at Harvard Medical School. He's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Cutaneous Medicine and Surgery and Board of Governors for the Canadian Dermatology Foundation. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft and uh, Dr. Lind. And I'm uh, speaking to you today from sunny Toronto, where it's about 20 degrees here right now. And ironically, there's an anti-mask protest happening outdoors. I had to close my window so the sound wouldn't come in and disrupt our presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19, and I'll go through five interesting facts I've learned over the course of my reading. I'm an amateur I, you know, I wannabe ID doc, so I read about this quite a bit, and it kind of ties in well with my background in public health and epidemiology. So first thing I've learned, this has happened before and will happen again many times, likely within our lifetime as well. This is a photograph from uh, Kansas during 1918, during the Spanish flu, showing one of the uh, field hospitals set up for returning soldiers who are sick with influenza. As Spanish flu, which probably started actually in the US, uh, went around the globe over 1918 and 19. It infected one third of the population and caused at least 50 million deaths. It's quite literally the mother of all pandemics. Pretty much every strain of influenza A going around today is actually from Spanish flu. So if you've had flu in your lifetime, you've had Spanish flu. In fact, the vaccines we still receive actually provide protection against this. This is H1N1. There was also the Russian flu, which was actually not as well known as Spanish flu. It was in the late 18th century. It, in, it killed about a million people worldwide and was thought to be an influenza virus for many years. However, there's been some new analysis and it's thought now that likely Russian flu was probably a coronavirus, likely from a cow, so bovine coronavirus. This uh, ended up becoming human coronavirus OC43. OC43 is one of the two major coronaviruses in circulation worldwide. It causes about one in 10 common colds. This is a Prince Albert Victor. He was one of Queen Victoria's grandsons who was second in line for the throne. He died from probably what was coronavirus in the late 18th century. We know that with most coronaviruses, antibodies last for one to three years. Uh, with COVID-19, um, after three months, you often can't detect them in the blood anymore. So why doesn't this coronavirus still cause pandemics? It's a concept called residual immunity. So what that means is that you're partially immune. The antibodies drop off after a few years, you still get infected, but your memory T cells uh, maintain some memory of that virus. When you do get OC43, it doesn't cause a severe COVID-19 like illness, it causes a mild head cold. This is why I think that uh, COVID-19 will likely be with us long-term, even with the vaccine. It will likely circulate forever going forward. But the good news is likely in future years, it won't be as severe. So practical points are the first thing I learned. Expect future pandemics, and they will likely happen more often. In most cases, we should be having a pandemic every couple of decades. We've been quite lucky to not have a major pandemic in more than a century. Second point, beware of loud talkers. I'm sure we've all read about the Spinco outbreak. This was a spin studio in Hamilton. There was a major COVID outbreak, a super spreading event. This um, uh, gym was actually well managed. They had temperature checks, they had screening questions, the bikes were well cleaned. 
They had at least two meters of distancing between all the people. But what was the issue? They were exercising, breathing heavily in an enclosed space. There's a Quebec karaoke bar. They were not distanced, but this was another super spreading event that caused 60 cases of COVID-19. Which brings us to how it's transmitted. COVID's transmitted by contact, droplet, and airborne. We think contact likely is not a huge role as we thought it was. So, you know, washing off your groceries makes no real sense. I think there's a value to hand washing and to um, high touch surfaces, but less so than what we thought. Droplets the main mode of transmission. Uh, most of the droplets are larger or medium size. So they actually fall out of the air after a meter or two. And that's where the two meter rule comes from. And droplet and airborne aren't two separate concepts or the same thing. Very, very small droplets that stay in the air is essentially airborne. And this is a continuum. So in a lot of these cases of super spreading events in enclosed areas with loud talking and singing, you aerolizing virus, you're getting very small droplets that are airborne for a short period of time. That's why um, no amount of distancing will help if you're speaking, singing, exercising with no ventilation. You know, the other question is, if COVID-19 is so contagious, why doesn't everyone get it? In a household, the attack rate's only 70%. Despite the fact the R0 is about 2.5 to 3. This means that each COVID patient should be giving the virus to two or three people, which is not always the case. And why is that? That brings us to our next important concept, which is the K value. This has not been reported in the media very much or in the scientific journals. The K value is a dispersion factor. So lower number is more dispersion. So with COVID-19, a small number of people are causing most of the spread. The R0 value is really only useful for things like influenza, where it's kind of one to one to one, one person passes it on. In COVID-19 and probably other respiratory illnesses, uh, you have a small number of people with a very, very high viral load causing most cases. And about, we think about 10% of cases are causing 80% of all infections, which is quite amazing. So what are the practical points about this? We don't know who's a super spreader. You have to really assume everybody in your office is carrying a loaded gun, and you have to enforce those public health rules vigorously. And when I see patients, if they remove their mask for an exam, I keep it brief, and I tell them when your mask is off, no talking. This talking we know aerolizes virus and can contribute to spread. It creates a lot of droplets. Third point, most outbreaks are actually in the lunchroom. So beware of your friends. In a hospital-based study uh, in the US, they found that in most cases, outbreaks were caused by being in the break room, having food with your coworkers and not distancing. Similarly in Wuhan, China during the outbreak, initially there was community contagion but then most transmissions were happening in the households and in the lunchrooms in the hospitals. The same thing in Canada. So you really have to be strict in your offices with your staff taking breaks. They should be sitting a minimum of two meters apart, if not more than that. They should be staggered. And you want to ventilate the space as well. If you have a very small lunchroom with no ventilation um, and staff are eating and talking and they're a meter or less than two meters away from each other, you're going to have an outbreak at some point, which will cause you to shut your office down. My second major point, uh, my fourth major point, most COVID drugs don't really work. Remdesivir, which was the most promising um, drug for COVID, is made by Gilead, and Gilead also makes Truvada, which is a, a HIV medication and used in patients with Hep B. In the NIH trial in the US, um, they did not find a mortality benefit, but there was a decreased uh, time in hospital. For this reason, the FDA gave them emergency authorization. Donald Trump got this drug when he was um, in Walter Reed. Unfortunately, the WHO trial, which is called Solidarity, did not find any benefit whatsoever that had a much bigger sample size. There was no effect for mortality or recovery time whatsoever. Regeneron is making antibodies for COVID. Donald Trump also received these. They don't really work. The trial was stopped abruptly and they're now focusing on giving it to patients at low risk. But to give somebody at low risk, uh, you know, a $10,000 antibody cocktail, to me seems like bad money. Uh, Lily's trial for their antibody was also stopped as well. 
So practical tips, don't rely on drugs to save us from COVID-19, except for dexamethasone, but it's only in very, very severe cases. And the vaccines hold by far the most promise, which brings me to my last point, COVID vaccines. This is in the New York Times. They have a great uh, page tracking COVID vaccine development. There are already three vaccines in phase three. Many are very, very promising. There's one from Pfizer, from J&J, &J, uh, both very promising. Moderna has a promising vaccine as well. Sanofi's in the vaccine game. Likely the Pfizer vaccine has the most promise. It's mRNA based, it's a new technology. They're developing this in, co in conjunction with a company in China and in Germany. Um, it appears to be quite effective for producing robust antibody responses from their phase two data. The downsides though, is it'll be two doses like most COVID vaccines and will require deep cold storage of minus 80. So Pfizer's actually developed its own supply chain for this. And in the US, they're working with McKesson to distribute the vaccine um, throughout the country using their own technology. They will apparently have 100 million doses by the end of this year, of which 40 million are going to the US. And by 2021, 1 1.3 billion doses. We're thinking that Pfizer will probably have most of the market share, like the 50% or so, followed by J&J, &J, uh, followed by everybody else. So vaccines, lots in development, likely multiple vaccines will be developed. Most will be two doses, although a few will be one dose, and they should be out sooner rather than later. So takeaway message, uh, COVID-19 is not unique. It's unique that we haven't had a major pandemic in 100 years. Be careful with loud talkers and enclosed spaces. So have your patients keep their masks on. When the masks are being removed for an exam, no talking. Be very careful in the lunchroom. You want to ventilate it, have it not that busy, and space it all apart as much as possible. Don't invest in drugs to save us from COVID-19, but thank them the vaccines. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a great meeting in Vancouver. Anybody have any questions for Patrick? In the audience? There's one in the chat. In, in the chat, we have, a, uh, we have a number of comments. Got Everett type. From Everett, Dr. Tip, he says, it's not really a question. It's more of a statement. Read it, read it. Vaccine safety, prevention of deaths, prevention of severe illness, and duration of protection need determination before marketing. Likely will be deficiencies of one or other of these when launched. Louise Gagnon says, how can clinicians respond to vaccine hesitancy that patients may have? Patrick, that's a practical question. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if somebody doesn't want the vaccine, there's no point counseling them for 20 minutes. But I do think if they're kind of on that border, which you can often tell, it is worthwhile taking the extra five minutes to kind of make your pitch. Um, and I think what I've been doing to reassure patients when they've asked me about the vaccines and development is saying, well, you know, this vaccine is so scrutinized, they have millions of safety checks. And I, if you look at the trials, they have, you know, 50 or 60 items they're looking at their data on. So when I tell patients that, they're more reassured by it. Uh, the FDA's requirement for the vaccines is minimum 50% efficacy for approval. So that's what their target is. Likely it'll be higher than that, though. But the duration, we're not sure about. It, it likely will require a yearly vaccine like the flu virus, probably. Very interesting. Anyone have any questions who is live here today? Yes, Dr. Joe. Patrick, can you comment on the various uh, success rates of different types of masks that are in the office? Dr. Joe is interested to know that. Yeah, so the most effective mask is N95 by far. I think this would be the mask of choice if you're doing a lot of facial surgeries. Um, so if you're a most surgeon, if you're doing cosmetic work, uh, your typical medical-based um, level three mask is very effective. If both you and the patient are wearing a mask and you're less than two meters, it's 95% effective. If just you are wearing the mask, um, then it's about 70% effective, which is why when I, my patients take off their masks, I have them not talk. And I look from the side usually to avoid the droplet spray. 
if they do speak by accident or cough or breathe. Very, very good. And Dr. Wayne Gulliver asks, what percent of us need to get the vaccine for it to be effective? Uh, we don't know 100%, but probably at least 80% of the population, which is not going to happen most likely. Dr. Uh, or sorry, Luis Gagnon asks, any guidelines for DERMs who are prescribing immunosuppressive agents or biologic to patients in terms of whether the agents will put their patients at risk for COVID-19? That's a very broad question, but just in general, Patrick, any, anything that you recommend? I usually try to reassure my patients. So if they're on a biologic, I will tell them that you have a higher risk of infection, but people often think they're immunocompromised. And to me, that term is for a patient who has chemotherapy, they've had a bone marrow transplant, they had a kidney transplant, whether they're on multiple agents. So I say, you know, yes, you're immunosuppressed, but as long as you're following all the public health guidelines, no limitations for your activities. Um, I do tell them if they develop fever to get COVID tested, and if they're due for an injection of the biologic to hold off um, for a week or two, like you would for any infection. So precautionary principle always applies. I worry most about my patients on cyclosporin and mycophenolate, because those agents are very immunosuppressive. So in those cases, I've tried to find alternatives or to reduce the dose if I could. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Denise asks, uh, what about the three layer mask now being suggested? Is that, um, is that a good suggestion? I think so. I think any mask is better than no mask. We've known for a long time that the bandanas provide very little protection. It's better than nothing. But I think this is just moving the, the uh, public health recommendations in line with science. And I think they've done a better job over the last few months of kind of just making these things public and out there as opposed to waiting until all the data comes in. So I think there was a lot of criticism early on of the leadership that they didn't recommend masks because there was no evidence for them. The, the absence of evidence does not imply no evidence. So that looks like that's all the questions for the for Patrick. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Fleming. Yes, Chuck? Uh, just uh, in terms of Patrick, do you think, you know, Canada has been uh, much stricter, obviously, than our neighbors to the south. Um, I, I think that if we're going to get through this, it's going to have to be uh, very strictly enforced about wearing masks in public, um, when you go to the store, when you go to your dentist, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I think this needs to be backed up with something such as a fine uh, mm -hmm. for people that don't. Uh, and I think there needs to be a more heavy-handed approach, uh, even in Canada. Um, Patrick, any comments? I, I think the only issue I would worry about with that is um, it, it might marginalize groups of people who have to go out in public more often. So if you, if you miss your mask, it's going to be a bit of an issue. I, 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 I'm always worried about fining people because whenever we implement fines, it often affects um, people in groups that have traditionally you know, been, um, had issues with the police before. So I, I'm, I'm just always very cautious about that. Yeah, thanks. I think, it make, I think it makes sense in, in, you know, from a global perspective, but I think if you look at the communities who will likely get all the fines, it'll be disproportionately towards those uh, marginalized groups, just, just because of the, in, the implicit bias in society. Yeah. And prediction, we call this area right now the new normal. Mm -hmm. When do you think we're going to get back to kind of somewhat the old normal when uh, walking down the streets of Toronto or Vancouver? Uh, we're not going to have to wear masks. May, we may be still restricted in traveling to other countries. Uh, any predictions on that one? Two years. Yeah. Okay. A long time. That may be optimistic too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even if the vaccine launches in the spring and we all get it, you have to have the whole world get it. Yeah. So the I guess the lesson for all of us as dermatologists is. Continue to stock up on your personal uh, protective equipment for your offices. Uh, yes. I think we had, most of us are able to get supplies now. A number of companies have turned over to producing these things. Uh, but just be aware, uh, there's still potentials for further surges. So I think you need to kind of have some a bit of a stockpile for each of us so that we can move forward as uh, we're trying to see patients in our own offices. I agree. Thank you. Great yeah. talk, uh, Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Kraft, and thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. Outstanding.